Hello there, my name is Pastor Chris Troxell. Thank you so much for joining us. This uh, video is created for our Wednesdays, uh, our Wednesday night series uh, in Philippians, Pressing On or Press On. Um, these videos, uh, this whole series is put together right now during the uh, pandemic of the coronavirus for uh, the year 2020. And um, a lot of people are already wanting to skip over 2020. Um, even some some uh, athletics and different groups are just already thinking, all right, 2020 is a wash. Let's look ahead to 2021. What, what can we do to just kind of keep going? Uh, but uh, looking to the future can be good and be, be hopeful, maybe a little more certainty, but that doesn't help us in the right here and now. And uh, the here and now, what's happening in this moment is that um, because there is a future coming, because there is a tomorrow, we can press on and because we know who holds the future, we know who's holding us right now. So um, whenever you're viewing this, if it's in the, at the same time uh, the, the pandemic's happening or whether you view, you're viewing this later or whether the pandemic's affecting you or not really so much, uh, something else maybe is weighing on your heart or on your mind or uh, mixed around with that all together, um, God calls us. He comes to, to each of us. He comes to you and he says, press on. There's more. There's something better coming. There's something better coming up. I am with you here and now. So let's press on to get to that point. And uh, Pastor Justin has been leading us through these first two messages uh, about pressing on through uh, God's faithfulness. And uh, he spoke to us last time about continuing that idea of pressing on. And today we're looking at pressing on through the glory of God. So by God's glory, he gives us the power to press on. And how do we do that? And all this is building up to what Paul's writing in a book, in a, in a letter actually called Philippians. We call it a book because it's in a Bible and it seems to us kind of lengthy, but um, it's actually pretty short. And at the end of the letter, Paul talks more about pressing on. We're going to we're building up to that over the next few weeks. And so tonight, today, we're talking about pressing on. We're in chapter 2 of Philippians. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, beginning uh, verses, uh, verse 1 and going to verse 11. And there's some great stuff in there, man. Uh, talking about the glory of God. Now, what is it like to think about God's glory? I mean, we don't necessarily experience that in some forceful ways, right? We don't have an angel appearing to us um, daily, overwhelming us and causing us to fall to the ground because of uh, the holiness of God, the power of God that's at work through that angel, the glory of God. Uh, so what is the glory of God? How do we talk about that? Uh, so we're going to be breaking that down. We're going to be diving into who Jesus is and how the glory of God relates to Jesus and how all that relates to you. And so let's uh, get ready to do that by calling out to God, asking him to bless our time together. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word that comes to us. Thank you for uh, the good things that you bring to us. Lord, uh, touch our hearts, our hearts and our minds by your spirit. Uh, move in us uh, to see and to hear the things that you have in there for us, uh, to change us, to encourage us, um, to help us to be equipped with your spirit with your power, with your glory, for your sake and, Lord, for the sake of those uh, that we share this planet with. We pray this in, in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to be in uh, first, uh, sorry, in Philippians chapter 2. Um, as maybe you're turning there in a Bible or flipping there on a, on a webpage, uh, if that's where your Bible is or on an app. Think about the last time you met somebody famous or somebody important, where you were kind of overwhelmed by who that person was. Um, you recognized them as somebody important or a celebrity, they were famous, they were powerful, something, and you just got kind of nervous and you didn't know what to do. Uh, for me, that was, um, I was on my way back from a mission trip to Guatemala. So me and my team, we had gone to Guatemala, we were on our way back, we were at an, at an airport waiting to catch our connecting flight, and who should sit down uh, the next section of chairs over from us, but Tim Blake Nelson. He's a famous actor. He's been in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Um, and so many movies. He's such a, he's one of my favorite, uh, favorite actors. Um, and 
I was so overwhelmed in that moment. I was just like, man, what do I say? What do I do? And it was one of those moments where I, I definitely could have gone up and said something to him, right? But it was also one of those moments where, you know, I don't know how much time by himself this guy gets. And I know me. <laughs> and it was one of those things like, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. So I chose to give that man some space uh, to not uh, gush like I, I, I almost felt it coming on. And so I just, uh, his fame and uh, who he was as a person and what he's been, been doing, the power of his work, uh, definitely kind of changed the atmosphere for me, changed kind of my thinking, my reaction in that moment. So I wonder for you, who's that been for you? Have you ever had a moment like that where you're just kind of overwhelmed in the moment um, uh, speaking to somebody? Um, and so when we think about that in terms of fame and then glory, uh, that word in Greek here in uh, Philippians and other places in the New Testament and the Old Testament too, where it talks about the glory of God. Uh, it talks about the glory of God, his renown, his, his fame, um, not just how well he is known, but also the power that stands behind why he is known. And so if we want to understand the glory of God, we need to seek to understand the source of that glory, the source of that power. Um, and God has made that clear, that that person, he's, he's made himself clear to us in the person of Jesus. And so if we want to understand the glory of God, we need to look no further than Jesus. Um, now it may seem like an obvious place to start, or maybe a not that great place to start, because I want to talk about the God-sized stuff, the God-sized glory. Um, and Jesus, uh, as an amazing man as he was, and we believe he's true man and true God, uh, both 100% man, 100% God at the same time, it, it doesn't blow your mind quite as much as thinking about the Father or the Spirit. And so we, we turn toward Philippians chapter 2, um, uh, starting at verse 1, and Paul's kind of breaking it down. He's encouraging the believers, the people who are following Jesus and his teachings and his way of life at a town called Philippi. And he says these words. He writes to them, So if there is any encouragement in Christ that is Jesus, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very form of a servant, of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that is why we're talking about glory today. And that's why we're talking and looking at the person of Jesus. Everything that Paul wrote about there, describing who Jesus is, describing what he's done. Uh, these things are so important uh, for us to grasp. And so this isn't the only place you'll hear uh, Paul talking about Jesus and what he's done. Uh, you'll hear that in each of the books that he writes, each of the, each of the letters he writes, to make sure that uh, the, the believers he's writing to encourage and teach grasp different perspectives on what it means to know Jesus, what it means to love and follow Jesus. And so uh, we look to these words too. Um, 
gleaning from this some words from Paul that help us press on. So I want to start first by that word, by that phrase, Jesus Christ. Even just maybe expanding the phrase a little, Jesus Christ is Lord. So let's take a look at that. Jesus Christ is Lord. It's in verse 11. And that phrase, Jesus Christ is Lord, that's a powerful phrase. It's a statement of faith, actually. It's an early form of a creed, right? It In those three words, four words, Jesus Christ is Lord, it tells you everything you need to know. Um, so the, the two words taken together, sometimes in, in other languages, there's a bit of shorthand. And so, like, we use the word is between words. Some other languages don't use that. Greek is one of those. And so when you, sometimes you're reading words together, um, and it says, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, sometimes it's confessing. It's saying, Jesus is the Christ. Right? Jesus is the Christ. No, it can definitely express each of those words, maybe for emphasis. But if that's not the main point, and it's building to something else, uh, Paul's building to something else in this case, uh, sometimes he'll just smush that together to, to take what the purpose is on that statement about Jesus and transfer the attention to where it should be. What else is it saying about the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord in this case. So Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the chosen one. He is the anointed one. He is the one God chose, the one God selected and sent to be for you, to, to live his life for you, to, to die his death for you, and to rise from the dead for you. Jesus is for you. Jesus is the Christ. And now we take that with the next part of that phrase, Jesus Christ is Lord. Who knew there was so much packed in four words, right? Um, but Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the Christ and he is Lord, meaning there is no one uh, above him. There is no one on the same level as him. Even as we learn to follow Jesus and he takes us one day to be with him where he is, we're still always going to be creator, Jesus, Savior, God, and humans, right? And so Jesus doesn't make us God like him. He does take us to be with him, though. So he is our friend. He is human like us, for sure, but he's also God. And so there will always be that distinction between us and Jesus. And, and so there's no one equal. There's no one greater than Jesus. He's it. And even though there may be lots of people in this world uh, with a different confession, right? A uh, different set of beliefs that they think Jesus is all right, uh, but he's not the greatest. They're following a different spirit. They're following a different teaching, something that's taken them a direction away from who God is revealing himself to be in Jesus. And so Jesus Christ is Lord. Man, it's a powerful, powerful statement. And so uh, as we go on, we also uh, take a look at uh, what this is building, uh, what, what built up towards this. So why does Paul end the reading with Jesus Christ as Lord, right? What is he building from? Well, he's, he's writing to believers, right? He's writing to encourage them on how to have some unity, how to work together. And the common ground everyone has in faith is Jesus. That's a starting point for believers. Even if we're uh, from, a diff from many different walks of life, even if we don't speak the same language, right? We still have Jesus in common. Jesus is our found foundation and our common ground. And so that's where we start. And so uh, Paul is saying, have your unity in Jesus and who he is and what he's done. And so uh, Jesus Christ being Lord is that common ground from where we start. Um, and then what did Jesus do? How? Why is Jesus called Lord? Why do we, as uh, uh, Paul writes in verse 9, God, why did God the Father exalt him and bestow on him the name that is above every name? Right? Why would God do that? Well, to understand that, we need to go back to verses 5 through 8, right? Uh, so God did this, he gave him the name Jesus, right? Even before he was born, right, he sent the angel to, jo to Joseph. We hear this account in Matthew um, early on, chapter 2, 
Um, we hear the account of the angel uh, going to Joseph and saying, uh, name him Jesus, because name your, your soon-to-be son Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And why do we do that? Because of what Paul wrote about, what Paul knows, what he, he knows about Jesus. Jesus is the one who appeared to him on the road uh, to Damascus. Jesus is the one that changed him from being one who persecutes the followers of Jesus and to becoming one of their greatest servants, one of their greatest missionaries, one of his biggest advocates, one of his uh, most central witnesses in terms of what he's written and the writings we still have. And his writings that were circulated in so many churches uh, across that region, but then also across time. How many people have read this story and been encouraged in faith over the last 2,000 years? They were reading these words too. And so what did Jesus do? Verse 5, uh, towards the end of verse 5, into verse 6 actually. Uh, who, who is Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not... In- and count equality with God something to be grasped, right? He was in nature God, but he didn't come to earth to flaunt his godness, right? He didn't want to come here and prove who he was. He didn't come here with an argumentation or an apologetic to convince people and argue with them about who he was. His apologetic was love. Uh, The thing that he did to speak to people was to be present with them. And he didn't consider anyone too good or too dirty. He didn't consider people too far or too close. He came to be with people. And those who thought they were doing the Lord's work and were getting it wrong, he brought them correction. They didn't necessarily want it, but he brought that correction. And to those who were crushed, to those who were repentant, those who were feeling the weight and sorry for their sins, he brought relief. He brought grace. He brought new life for them. This is what Jesus did. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. But instead, he he, taking the form of a servant, he humbled himself, right? So, Taking the form of a servant, that's where it starts. He became, he was born in human likeness at the end of verse 7 there. So he took the role of a servant, and among the servants of people, he took a lower form. He humbled himself even more. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. So even though the rules of death didn't apply to Jesus, he submitted himself to those rules, to the rule of death. Why would Jesus do that? For you. Jesus does this for you. He leaves heaven. He leaves the Father for you. He humbles himself for you. He humbles himself to the point of death for you. And in death, even the worst kind of death, death on a cross. That's what Jesus does. That's who he is. And that's what, he, that's what he's done for you. And this is why we get to verse 9. Why God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name, the name that is above every name. And why is Jesus' name greater than any of her, every other name? Because no other name has done this. No other person has done this work for you. It's all Jesus for you. It's all Jesus for you. And so now, so we've gone over kind of what glory is in general. It's fame, it's power, it's stuff that uh, goes with a person into a situation. We understand who that is in the person of Christ and why he's glorified, right? Uh, this, This kind of great reversal, right? Somebody who's the most humble being in the face of the earth, submitting himself even to death, even the worst form of death, flips that around, redefines it all. Instead of being a horrible, shameful death, it becomes a symbol and a teaching for hope for the world across time to the glory of God the Father. Here's where we got we get back to glory. So at the name of Jesus, verse 10, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That means everyone dead, everyone living, everyone who's going to be alive, everyone who ever has lived, every tongue will confess that what? What's the creed? What's the statement of faith? 
Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. No one can say Jesus is Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Spirit. You can't say that. You cannot say that statement of faith unless God's Spirit is at work in you. It's this foreign, this, uh, this uh, theologians call it sometimes this alien work, right? This foreign work of God in us, a work that's outside ourselves. God comes in and does that and teaches us what we can never do on our own. He teaches us to confess with our whole heart, with our mind, with all our strength that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he teaches us to do that with our whole life. Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Christ. And he is Lord. And so it's this glorious presence among us that changes everything. The people in the Old Testament knew this. The people in the New Testament knew this. People who have known God's word and as it's come to them, as God's spirit has come to them across time, have known this glory. And our prayer is that you would know this glory too. This glory that is so great and so mighty. It can fill a temple. It can alter the the course of world events, but it can also be close enough and intimate enough and potent enough that it changes your heart and it changes your life. That is the glory of God at work in the person of Jesus. I want to uh, end our our time together with this thought. That uh, from 2 Corinthians, another letter Paul wrote, uh, chapter 4, verse 16. Talking about God's glory here in chapter 4 as well to another group of believers called Corinthians. And he writes these words to encourage them through some hardship they're going through, so some difficult times they're going through. But again, that focus on the future, that what we're experiencing right now is not it. It's not all there is. There's more. There's something better coming. And so Paul writes these words, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning of verse 16. He says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away our bodies, the world around us, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction, though it may not seem that way to us now, and the persecution, the suffering that God's church was going through at the time, was not uh, insignificant or or, uh, light, but it will seem light and momentary, right? It's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, right? And people can look at the world around them and interpret it any way they want. That's not what we look at. It's not what God looks at, right? He cares for it. We're, he's aware of it. We care for it. We're aware, aware of it. But that's not where we go for truth and comfort, right? We go not to the things that are seen, but to the things that that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, right? They're temporary. They don't last. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Those things that are unseen, what? Faith, hope, love, humility, being of one mind in Jesus. It doesn't mean we all... uh, check our brains at the door and we march lockstep with everything the other person is saying. Now we're not sinking our minds up to the other person. Right? We're finding unity in Jesus. This guy changes our hearts. He teaches us about humility. He teaches us about forgiveness, about serving one another, about giving up your life, laying your life down for another. Now Jesus already gets all the glory, so it's not about that. But it is about knowing that Jesus loves you. How that changes you. It can change how you live, even in the midst of, of a pandemic. So may Jesus continue to bless you through his word. May he continue to grow faith in you uh, as you learn about his glory and everything else that he gives you to help you press on. In his name, amen. Amen.